गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन आई एम डॉक्टर सुमंत दे एंड आई वेलकम यू ऑल द फर्स्ट एडिशन ऑफ लैपरोस्कोपिक वर्कशॉप कोलकाता इट्स अ टू डे एक्सटेंसिव प्रोग्राम फॉर बेसिक लैपरोस्कोपिक ट्रेनिंग एंड वी हैव एंडोलेब ट्रेनिंग फेसिलिटीज इंक्लूडिंग ड्राई एंड वेट लैब एंड एनिमल टिश्यू लैब एंड देन वी हैव एक्सटेंसिव बेसिक लैपरोस्कोपी ऑपरेशन लाइक लैपरोस्कोपी कोलेसिस्टेक्टमी डिफरेंट काइंड ऑफ हार्नियर्स सो विल बी ऑल डन बाई us the faculties uh, from uh, india they are coming from the different parts of the india so they are very efficient and they are here already to guide you through in each and every step i would everyone request i will request everyone to if you have any doubt any confusion any questions regarding any part of the program like uh, any lectures or during endolab training we are there we will be there with you all the time so we'll start from today first we have uh, our uh, respected dr devi prasad samadhar the uh, uh, medical affairs uh, department and the head of the director of medical affairs so i would request him to come and uh, uh, start the program with his inaugural speech good morning ladies and gentlemen at the outset i would like to welcome all the delegates who had come from different part of the country the faculty who had spared their time and had taken the pains to come here to share their knowledge and skill with the delegates dr makhanlal saha in particular a well known teacher and a professional he has spared his time for this workshop i am very much thankful to him the department of surgery had taken this initiative i must thank dr sumanth dev for taking this pain to organize this workshop the other members of the department of surgery dr goth agrota dr devachan ghosh they have extended their help for organizing and making this program a success you will be pleased to know that ruby general hospital apart from playing its clinical role is getting indulged in academic activity we have started dnb program in five discipline and in one of the discipline we have got super specialty course also in critical care surgery medicine radiotherapy anesthesia in all we have started dnb program and this is a very unique initiative that had been taken by dr sumanth dev to organize this workshop i think this will not be the end this is the beginning and other departments who are running academic course they will also take cue from this initiative and they will organize such courses in future for the delegates i will like to mention many of them look very senior so while the clinical expertise is being shared and they are trying to imbibe that how the faculty members they conduct themselves that also is very very important how they interact how they write what is their commitment what is the integrity how do they document all these things are very very important so only becoming a good surgeon is not important or good anesthesiologist or good faculty uh, professional in any fac, uh, discipline is not important it is important that how do we conduct so i think though the time is very short but this aspect also will be taken into note by the delegates i think many of them in future will be conducting similar courses and will be playing a leading role as far as the knowledge sharing is concerned so dr sumanth dev i thank you thank all members of the surgery department for taking this initiative and all the best to this uh, program thank you thank you so much thank you dr somadar so 
as we surgeons all know that uh, without anesthesia we cannot do surgery. So I would like to start the program with a very uh, didactic talks on uh, lap anesthesia in laparoscopic surgery and what a surgeon must know. So I would like to invite Dr. Atul Kundu, our consultant anesthetist, uh, to enlighten us about this part. Thank you. Good morning to one and all. I shall be speaking on the anesthesia related problems and the physiological changes that occurs during a laparoscopic procedure. Uh, to an audience whom I do feel are experts or marvelous in anatomy. So my attempt will be to bridge between the physiology and the anatomical concept. So modern day surgical care is basically a triadic relationship between the patient, surgeons and the anesthesiologist where comes the care team model. Surgeon in one hand focuses on the specific region of the body or task on his hand. Whereas an anesthesiologist focuses mainly in maintaining the homeostasis. So there has been a paradigm of shift in the last decade, or I should say in the last century, where the surgeons were known as the ship captains in the turbulent water. Now there has come to the concept of dynamic co-captains, where each one should share their responsibility for the better outcome. Thereby it is prudent that all specialities should have a basic knowledge about the other for the best possible patient care. To us, as anesthesiologists, basically laparoscopy is a minimally invasive procedure where uh, endoscopic access is done to the peritoneal cavity after insufflation of the gas, which is most obviously mainly the carbon dioxide, to create a space between the anterior abdominal wall and viscera for the safe manipulation for instrumentation and while the surgeons will be dealing with the organs. I shall not go into the types. You all are more versed than me on the types of laparoscopic surgery. Coming to advantages, yes, it produces minimal scar, minimal pain, and uh, where we all are now restricted with our uh, problems that we can rapidly return to our normal activities. And believe me all surgeons, as anesthesiologists I am saying, whenever anesthesiologists ask you, no, they cannot give the uh, case, argue with them that yes, laparoscopy preserves better respiratory function in the post-operative period. This is very, very important and that's why laparoscopy has really gained a lot of success. Coming to disadvantages, it is more expensive and yes, it requires a long learning curve. As such, there is no absolute contraindication for laparoscopic surgery, but I doubt that whether surgeons will ask a patient who is in shock, who are receiving inotropes, whether they will go ahead with laparoscopy. I think that, that, that time you will have to uh, judge between the risk-benefit ratio. Usually patients in shock goes for laparotomy. Relative contraindications, various relative contraindications are there like diaphragmatic hernia, history of recent myocardial infarction, patients with severe lung disease, those having very high intracranial pressure, VP shunts, hypovolemia, valvular heart disease and lastly for organomegaly, again when a patient is having a huge uterus or a huge spleen, the surgical access will be difficult. So those are cases which stands for relative contraindication. Uh, the gas for pneumoperitoneum, yes, a uh, lot of features are there. They, sh they should be colorless, non-toxic. But if we come to the basic, when laparoscopy is being done, a surgeon is actually inflating the abdomen. And there is only one organ which can actually excrete the gases from the body, which obviously is the lungs. And the most, uh, like the, and the gas which is most predominantly excreted by the lungs is carbon dioxide. And that's where carbon dioxide wins all the rest. So basically, and more to it, carbon dioxide has the, uh, like we can also measure the amount of gas that is excreted. So basically that's where carbon dioxide comes to be very important and it wins all the rest over the other gases. Now yes, carbon dioxide does cause some problem as well. It causes hypercarbia, it can cause pain, abdomen, shoulder tip pain. It can predispose the patients to arrhythmia and peritoneal irritant, but compared to other gases, air, oxygen, nitrogen, nitrous oxide, helium and argon, where again carbon dioxide wins the races, it does, it does not support combustion and because of its high absorbability 
chances of gas embolism with carbon dioxide is very minimal compared to the other gases. Physiological changes that takes place during laparoscopy are mainly due to three factors. This is the mainly patient's position, the carbon dioxide itself, and the pneumoperitoneum which is being cre created. Now these factors will also lead to some anesthetic issues. Again, th 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 some of these are the same due to the patient position and the pneumoperitoneum which leads to produce the cardiovascular, the respiratory and the gastrointestinal changes that we are supposed to take care of. Uh, yes, in laparoscopic surgery, one of the very important problem for us anesthesiologists is we find difficult, difficulty in estimating the blood loss. Uh, the surgeons are not using any mobs or any gauge pieces when laparoscopy is being done. Moreover, the focus is mainly on the field of activity. So whatever blood that comes out will actually get accumulated in the dependent areas which we will not be able to access. So how do we access? Basically, we will have to depend only on the suction apparatus. The other problem is, no, the other side is, Yes, if there is severe bleeding and when the visibility is like getting uh, impaired, the surgeon will definitely open up the abdomen. Lastly, darkness in the operating room is really an issue. Uh, this is both from the surgeon as well as the anesthetic aspect. A surgeon can ask for a Maryland and he can be given a laparoscopic scissor in the dark OT, whereas for anesthesiologists, adrenaline, atropine and a n number of drugs may look similar. Now I shall slowly move on to the physiological effects that happens during a laparoscopic surgery. First I'll start with the cardiovascular effect. So basically there is initially a biphasic response. Once you all inflate the abdomen and there is a rise in the intra-abdominal pressure, as long as the pressure is below 10 mm of Hg, there is a milking effect. So the splanchnic circulation and the mesenteric circulation are squeezed, this will cause an increase in the venous return of the heart and this will try to maintain the cardiac output. As and when the intra-abdominal pressure rises to more than 15 mm of Hg, that is when the cardiac output gets compromised and it gets dropped to 10 to 30 percent. So where do we have now? We have a patient where the preload or the venous return of the heart is getting compromised. So the preload is diminished in a background where due to the rise in the intra-abdominal pressure, the systemic vascular resistance or the afterload is also compromised. So the venous, so the cardiac output has come down and the heart will have to pump against a more afterload. So this is not a very much of a problem in patients who are actually with normal cardiac activities, but patients who have a compromised cardiac problem, this causes, this may lead to precipitate to severe problems. And how basically do we manage it from surgeon's perspective and from anesthetic's perspective? From surgeon's perspective, inflate the abdomen very slowly. That is the only thing. From an anesthesiologist's perspective, preload the patient with adequate fluid so that the uh, like uh, giving the volume, as I give the volume, the preloading of the heart will be maintained and hence the heart will have the capability to pump out the blood. So basically what do we have? We have uh, the intra-abdominal pressure is raised, there will be pulling of blood in the legs, IVC compression, venous resistance will be increased, the venous return to the heart is decreased, the cardiac output comes down. On the other side, the intrathoracic pressure will get increased as the abdomen is, uh, abdominal pressure is increased. There will occur a rise in the systemic vascular resistance and the BP or the arterial pressure will appear to be raised. So the drop in the cardiac output will not be reflected in the monitors. The patient will have a high BP in a state where the cardiac output still remains compromised and to add on it, this patient with hypercarbia may have hypertension, tachycardia and acidosis, all leading to a mismatch between the myocardial oxygen demand and the supply. So the heart will ask for more oxygen, but the supply will remain compromised. Management again, as I already mentioned, preload this patient with adequate fluid. And in long laparoscopic surgeries, you can consider pneumatic compression of the leg so that the uh, venous return is maintained. And studies have shown that use of alpha-2 agonists like clonidine, dexmedetomidine has come with beneficial effect. 
uh, there are two figures in the left side uh, this is a figure where uh, the population in the blue has undergone preloading whereas the population in yellow has not undergone preloading in the first figure in the y axis cardiac index is plotted so uh, patients who have undergone laparoscopy it is quite prominent that after pneumoperitoneum the card drop in the cardiac in index is significant in patients who did not receive the preloading similarly it is just the opposite for the systemic vascular resistance systemic vascular resistance was higher in patients who did not receive the preloading uh, cardiac factors does not complete answer as I mention a few words about the arrhythmias arrhythmias are very common during the insufflation and the desufflation both times and factors like the volatile anesthetic agent lighter plane of anesthesia hypercarbia due to the use of uh, it, uh, carbon dioxide Str sudden stretching of the peritoneum all may lead to produce vagal stimulation and bradycardia uh, I'll move on to the pulmonary changes so basically when a surgeon inflates the abdomen it push the, pushes the diaphragm up now this change in the respiratory physiology does not cause a problem to the anesthesiologist as long as the patient's respiratory function is preserved but for patients who are obese and for them where the respiratory function is compromised this may lead to produce significant problems so basically what happens that there are two factors with gauge change one is the FRC or the functional residual capacity and the lung compliance so FRC is basically the amount of air that remains in the lungs after the normal expiration and this FRC is one of the important parameters for anesthesiologists for maintaining the oxygenation now this FRC will get severely reduced and the other factor is the lung compliance lung compliance is basically the change in volume by compliance we mean change in volume with change in pressure so what do we get it is in other terms a measure of the elasticity of the lung so what do we get we then get a stiff lung as and when the diaphragm moves up the, we get a stiff lung and thereby ventilation for us become very difficult to add on it as a surgeon is using the carbon dioxide the partial pressure of carbon dioxide PaCO2 in the arterial blood will also increase this is partly due to the absorption of the carbon dioxide from the peritoneal cavity and due to the high level of VQ mismatch that is the ventilation perfusion mismatch what happens the diaphragm moves up the smaller alveoli will get collapsed there will be at basal atelectasis and this will lead to shunting of the bloods that is the gaseous exchange will not take place this will further lead to a rise in the partial pressure of the carbon dioxide now this rise again in mild condition will not produce much problem but if the rise in PSEO2 is very high then the cardiac output blood pressure there, there will be acidosis and then the cardiac output and the blood pressure starts to drop in patients who are normal like uh, having a normal respiratory physiology this change in the PaCO2 is reflected by the end tidal ETCO2 that we measure which is very prudent the ratio is always maintained but in patients where there is very severe respiratory dysfunction what happens is the PaCO2 gets raised up but the end tidal carbon dioxide uh, change in the CO2 is not reflected in the end tidal carbon dioxide and those are the patients where we ask that arterial line may be established and ABG may be done uh, gastrointestinal system this is very obvious that there is rise in the intra-abdominal pressure the lower esophageal tone becomes lax along with that patient may have a head down position there will be increased gastric acid secretion the pH comes down and hence nasogastric tube is mandatory uh, in this institute what we usually do is we do on, uh, we usually put a suction catheter that is good enough mesenteric circulation is obviously decreased due to the rise in the intra-abdominal pressure and it is same for the uh, protohepatic circulation as well as the splanchnic circulation gets compressed uh, coming to the central nervous system increased intra-abdominal pr pressure will cause an increased lumbar spinal pressure as well this will cause a decrease in the drainage from the lumbar plexus and thereby the intracranial pressure also increases 
and on the top of it we have hypercarbia which will also cause a rise in the intracranial pressure lastly this will this may also be associated with the rise in the intraocular pressure as well thereby in patients who are suffering from glaucoma be cautious when a laparoscopy is being done renal perfusion rise in the intraabdominal pressure will cause a compromise in the renal blood flow cardiac output will come down and at the same time rise in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide all these factors will activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system so the glomerular filtration will come down urine output comes down but this drop in the urine output during laparoscopy is transient once the abdominal pressure is released and adequate preloading is done renal function usually comes back to normal as it was in the preoperative state temperature variation continuous flow of the gases in the peritoneum then as the gas will move from the uh, once you will infrared it will suddenly expand this will cause a drop in the temperature uh, neuro hormonal stress response though there are various studies that suggest that the stress response is similar to the open procedure but in practical as aspect what we find is the requirement of analgesic and the other drugs is somewhat less thromboembolism is an important factor that has to be taken into consideration so there is a rise in the intraabdominal pressure and thereby the venous return comes down associated with it patients may be in a head up position so there will be venous stasis and in long procedures like pelvic surgery malignant cases obesity surgeries a dvt prophylaxis has to be planned in the preoperative period uh nerve injury do rare but can take place hyper extension of the arm can produce brachial plexus injury lithotomy position can produce common peroneal injury uh patient positioning in the cardiovascular system when the patient is in the head down position the venous return cardiac output and mean arterial pressure increases which is just the opposite in case of the reverse tendinenberg position uh in the respiratory system vital capacity and frc as i already mentioned will come down which uh, actually improves slightly when the patient is the in the head up position uh now with the change of position the endotracheal tube positioning has also need to be checked so go the goals of our anesthesia management is to accommodate the surgical requirements and to allow for the physiological changes in a controlled manner uh, monitoring devices should be available uh, i have found many times a laparoscopic procedure uh, in smaller nursing homes being done in a three para monitor where only a pulse oximeter a ecg and a bp cuff is there for laparoscopic procedure a etco2 monitoring is prudent Uh, recovery from anesthesia should be rapid and with minimal residual effects and there is possibility of uh, requirement of a laparotomy should always be kept in mind uh, from a surgeon's perspective i'll just i have just highlighted the points which can be done in the preoperative period and in the intraoperative period uh, awareness regarding the post of shoulder pain we should be done retain informed consent for laparotomy should be taken in the preoperative dvt prophylaxis should be considered and use of clonidine dexmedetomidine with discussion of anesthesiologist to decrease the uh, stress response can be considered general anesthesia with endotracheal intubation and controlled ventilation is so far the safest technique you can always advise your anesthesiologist to preload the patient at a high volume of 5 to 10 ml per kg tracheal intubation is best considered proceal lma these are the lms which has a side gastric port where you can actually put a suction catheter and take out the secretions this lma can be used but it does not prevent aspiration uh, normocarbia has to be maintained by the anesthesiology so they will adjust their respiratory rate tidal volume minute ventilation uh, use of nitrox oxide in laparoscopic surgery is controversial yes it causes bowel distension and it may cause an increase in the chances of post operative nausea vomiting uh, a nasogastric tube placement always consider and in long procedure always consider for a catheterization uh, positioning when you are considering the positioning consider to gradually tilt it not a very rapid tilt or so each time after you positioning you check the position of the endotracheal tube considering padding of the pressure points and gas encephalation should be slow and as i mentioned for the cardiac factors 
always consider to keep the intraabdominal pressure less than 15 mm of Hg. While you inflate the abdomen, the diaphragm also moves up. This may also cause endobronchial intubation. The t actually, the tube can go into the right side. So it is always uh, advised to check the position of the tube. Postoperative morbidity mainly a shoulder tip pain and the postoperative pain, which anesthesiologist will take care. Postoperative nausea, vomiting also. We give lots of drugs to decrease this. Coming uh, to the point where we judge between general anesthesia and regional anesthesia. Yes, some studies have shown that regional anesthesia can be given in laparoscopic procedures, uh, especially in case of pelvic surgeries. But to my experience, I am not at all in favor of regional anesthesia. I will always consider general anesthesia. I'll mention the points. First is general anesthesia will produce muscle relaxation. And in a patient who is under regional anesthesia, he or she can suddenly cough. This might cause injury. Ventilation, take, control is better in general anesthesia. Aspir most important, aspiration prophylaxis is best in general anesthesia. And in regional anesthesia, other than the problem that the patient might cough or anything, there will be some degree of diaphragmatic irritation once you inflate the abdomen. So the surgeon will, uh, so the anesthesiologist will have to give some degree of sedation. Now this is very important. As I give sedation, these patients are already, uh, the respiratory function is compromised. I give sedation, further respiratory function will get compromised and hence there will be more accumulation of carbon dioxide. And in regional anesthesia, we don't have a method to measure ETCO2 as well. So basically my recommendation is always consider general anesthesia. Just to mention few complications, arrhythmia, hypo and hypertension, hypercarbia, gas embolism, pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, emphysema can take place. Uh, to summarize, carbon dioxide pneumoperitoneum results in ventilatory and respiratory changes. Uh, rise in partial pressure of carbon dioxide will aggravate the cardiorespiratory disturbances. Abnormal increase in ETCO2, uh, when you rule out other causes, you can always think of subcutaneous emphysema, whether it has happened or not. Uh, you're, you will, the patient will be covered with drapes, so just have a feel on the areas whether there is any crepitus or not. Hemodynamic changes decrease cardiac output and this is more in hemodynamic compromised patient. And lastly, preload, use of vasodilators, clonidine, dexmedetomidine, high dose opioids and beta blockers will attenuate pathophysiological hemodynamic changes. With that, I finish my lecture and this is our anesthesia department. I welcome all the delegates for the workshop on behalf of my anesthesia seniors, colleagues and my juniors. Thank you. Thank you, Ratulda. Uh, delegates, if you have any questions regarding anesthesia part during uh, for laparoscopic surgery, you can ask. So, if you have any questions or any doubts, anything. So, Ratulda, I have one question for you. Yeah, please. So, uh, people are coming here. Some uh, are practicing in metros. Some are practicing in peripheries. So, peripheries usually small setups. So, these are basic laparoscopy training course. So uh, people may, may have some doubts regarding, uh, sometimes they are afraid of doing laparoscopy in small setup. But uh, I would like to tell uh, you, I would like to request you to tell something that what are the three or four things that should be there in a small surgical setup where you can perform safely laparoscopy, cholecystectomy, appendectomy or any diagnostic laparoscopy. Uh, as I mentioned, the first point is, uh if you are in the peripheries, many a times we do have a three-para monitor where only pulse oximeter, BP and uh, the ECG is being monitored. Uh, I would consider ETCO2 is a, as an essential monitor for safety of the patients. Other than that, uh, yes, many a times where there they may say that no, we don't have a, uh, like they may, may not gi uh, give you a blank faces when they see that you are asking for a nasogastric tube for a laparoscopic surgery or a suction catheter. My suggestion is yes, you should put it. And in peripheries, when you are going, it is like uh, the surgeon and the anesthesiologist, there is no pre-anesthesia checkup or so. So be very cautious whether anything is hidden or any investigations is not there and if those are not there, recheck it. Lastly, even the anesthesiologist also comes first time when they see in the periphery. So there the preloading is not at all done. Wait for half an hour, give adequate volume to these patients and then start the surgery. Safety is foremost.
Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You. So, uh, most of our delegates are fresh pass outs after MAs, or most of us doing uh, senior residency in a bond posting. So, many of you have doubts that what are our futures, like what we have to do, we have to do MCH or we have to do laparoscopy, we have to learn laparoscopy or we, have, we can practice as a general surgeon or we can do, go back to our hometown and do uh, uh, laparoscopy. So, it's our honor and privilege to have Dr. Makhonlal Shah, uh, so our very own Dr. Makhonlal Shah to guide us about, uh, guide you all about on that topic. So, I would invite Dr. Makhonlal Shah. Uh, good morning. Uh, I must thank uh, Dr. Shumantra Day to uh, uh, have the vision to organize such uh, basic uh, surgical workshop, uh, which will be an introduction to the newcomers who can have uh, some uh, in-depth into the basic concepts like anesthesiology and surgical aspect. And uh, I know that uh, Shumantra is doing a very good job in Ruby and he is uh, constantly uh, posting educational videos and I think this sort of program will uh, encourage our youngsters to take up this specialty in a more scientific way. So I've been asked to describe about, discuss about the history of laparoscopy. The history is really fascinating. Uh, if you take this minimal access surgery, it is taken as one of the greatest success study in the history of medicine. And there has been tremendous development in the last century. Although laparoscopy is known till early 1900, there has been very little progress till 1960s. And from 1960s to 80s, uh, there has been a transition from diagnostic laparoscopy to some therapeutic interventions. It's a new model of surgery. And now it has been said that there are three milestones in development of modern surgery. One was anesthesia the control of infection and the laparoscopic surgery. If you go to the history of laparoscopy, you find the first inspection of the abdominal cavity was done by a gentleman known as George Kelling. He was a gastroenterologist. And way back in 1901, he commented that endoscopic methods will be used to a greater extent in the digestive tract than has been common practice so far. And in fact, in many instances, this will replace the standard laparotomy. So this he commented way back in 1901. Next gentleman who performed this organoscopy was Hans Christian Jacobius. In 1909, he performed the first inspection of the abdominal cavity and the thoracic cavity by using a cystoscope. He did not use air like Kelling to inspect the abdominal cavity. And he did a lot of thoracoscopic diagnostic procedures and he is described as the father of modern thoracoscopy surgery. This is Mr. Hans Jacobius. The first laparoscopy in the USA was done in 1911 by Bartam M. Barnheim and he named this method as organoscopy. He used a simple cystoscope and simple lighting. However, he changed his specialty to cardiovascular surgery and did not proceed further in the laparoscopy. This gentleman from Germany first has a vision to create a school of laparoscopy in Germany. He devised a telescope and trockers. This telescope was a primitive cystoscope and he used this mainly for diagnostic purposes. And he has a publication of large series of patients undergoing diagnostic laparoscopy and some liver biopsies. He is not a surgeon. His genus varies is a pulmonologist who devised a needle to create pneumothorax for treatment of tuberculosis. And he devised that needle with a spring loaded. And this is being used in our day to day practice with a spring loaded needle which provides safety for introduction of air into the pedal cavity. This gentleman from USA has performed a lot of diagnostic procedures including biopsies and he first reported a lot of complications following laparoscopic surgery. Following this period from 1940s onwards there has been very slow progress of laparoscopic surgery. 
This has been used by gynecologists mainly for some diagnostic purposes, for evaluation of infertility, tubal potency test. And this skepticism persisted. And people who are trying to do some laparoscopic procedure has faced a lot of repression by the old guard of open surgery surgeons. And it may be to know that this laparoscopic surgery was banned in Germany between 1950-61 in view of report of large number of complications following sterilization. There had been gut injuries and some patients has died. And till 1970s, late and 80s, it was confined to only diagnostic laparoscopy and aspiration of is not even cystectomy. This environment was not conducive to the change to have a wider application of laparoscopic procedures. This gentleman created a change how you look at laparoscopy. Dr. Cameron Nezat, he touted that this video technology should be applied to the laparoscopy procedure. Initially, the video was applied for documentation and educational purpose only. But Cameron, working with the industry, has developed this miniature video and that was applied and our approach to the whole field of laparoscopy has changed. However, he was also exposed to criticism and ridicule, but he performed many complex operations. However, his papers were refused for publication in different journals. Subsequently, he was exonerated following an investigation that, yes, this is a feasible and a scientific way of approaching the surgical abdomen. Afterwards, the development of this minimal invasive surgery was linked with some names like Raoul Palmer in Paris, Fangenheim and Kartsem. Of this, Kartsem is most exemplary gentleman. He is also a gynecologist. And uh, there is a saying that we go into the abdomen by Palmer's point. It is named after him, but it is reported that uh, he did not use this point as entering the abdomen. He always used umbilicus as the entry. Fangenheim is another gentleman who has done clerkship under Palmer in France and realized that laparoscopy was superior to caldoscopy. And he is the first person who worked with Dragger company to devise a carbon dioxide insufflator. The birthplace of modern laparoscopy was in Germany again at Kiel University. And this gentleman is marked as the founder of modern laparoscopy. And he was a most productive researcher. His family members were involved in manufacturing of medical instruments. And this helped him to devise a good number of laparoscopic setups, instruments. And in the development of this laparoscopic procedure, earlier people used to use a cystoscope and other viewing devices. But afterwards, two important milestones came up in development of laparoscopy. One was development of this telescope you use today with rod lens system. And next was a device of a coal light source. The light source used earlier was very hot. And this cannot be used for prolonged procedures. So these two development, innovation of a rod lens system by Hopkins and coal light source changed our attitude for subsequent development. Till 1970s, again, this procedure of different laparoscopy was confined to diagnostic part only. But Kurt Sem has the ability and courage to proceed for some therapeutic interventions in laparoscopy environmentarium. Kurt Sem could further modify and bring out an automatic electric insufflator that we are using today with some modifications. He developed newer instruments with his family members who are involved in medical instrument manufacturing. And he was the first person to perform a laparoscopy appendectomy in 1980. But he was in trouble. Like all other innovations, Karsem was in deep trouble. 
large number of gynecologists did not believe him that he is doing some therapeutic interventions for gynecology operations. They declared him that he is just putting the scope and doing a laparotomy and finishing the job. Surgeons did not accept his appendectomy. Surgeons started putting vouch that appendectomy in open technique is much safer than going for this risky procedure. The same contribution and his innovations was the international sense at the time. He traveled to different areas in Atlantics and tried to put his concept of operative laparoscopy to the international forum. He conducted some workshops, transmitted to different places, and he tried to popularize this technique of laparoscopy. But he was not viewed with optimism in Germany. There was a report at one time saying that he was called from the operation theater to have a CT scan of his brain to see whether he was mad or not. But he persisted. Kurt's same persistence lead to further development in laparoscopy. And he stood up what he believed despite the onset of criticism. And he popularized this technique and devised newer techniques in laparoscopy. However, there has been little progress till early 1980s. Afterwards, innovation of anesthesia and other changes, development of newer gadgets has led to further changes. There has been tremendous work on laparoscopy in German and a lot of German surgeon has published uh, articles based on their performances. With the innovation of SEM, the first laparoscopy collection is done by Eric Muhe in 1985. And he has a record of 97 successful operations by this technique. But this was not published earlier. Philip Murray is credited with the credit of doing first video laparoscopic cholecystectomy in 1987. However, they also faced criticism at the beginning for their innovation and performing this procedure by laparoscopy. This was a Eric Mohe, he was a Philip Mohe. And this opposition continues. The hand Stoddell in the senior surgeon at University of Surgery in uh, Kiel reported that at 107th Congress of the German Surgery in Berlin, an article on the first 100 laparoscopy was initially submitted and published by him was suddenly struck off from the official Congress. So that was the resistance people had uh, in this uh, newer mode of surgery. Taking coup from Kartsem, people in USA started thinking about laparoscopy and this was first presented by SEM in a convention in Baltimore. Encouraged by this, McConnell and Sai at Nashville first performed laparoscopy in USA. And subsequently, there has been media uproar. There has been tremendous demand from the patients. And this surgery get popularity very quickly. Till then, it was not defined as a specialty or a definite entity of surgical discipline. In contrast to the trends at the time, a group of German surgeons founded the Surgical Trust Group for Endoscopy and Ultrasound in 1976. Way back in 1981, the Society of American Gastroenterosurgeons were formed and they spearheaded the research training in laparoscopy. The first innovation in Britain was by E. A. Wickham and he used the term minimal invasive surgery. He performed and published his vision about endoscopy procedure in 1987 in British Journal of Urology. He also was exposed to substantial criticism. He first created the Department of Minimal Invasive Surgery in Britain. And he has a vision to say that although surgeons are against this newer procedure, the patients are liking this and they think the patient was right. 
little bit about history of leprosy in India. As you all knowing that the first leprosy procedure is done by Dr. Tempton E. Udadia at JJ Hospital. And he started his own setup. In fact, he commented at one place in his life story that he somehow got this instrument uh, without showing to the customs because it was banned that time to bring such uh, foreign gadgets. So he started this setup in Jeja Hospital and he trained a group of surgeons in Bombay and they spearheaded this surgery and there has been an explosion of this surgical intervention in different hospitals in Mumbai including KEM. Next to mention in India is a gentleman known as C. Palani Velu. He started this procedure in a small setup in Coimbatore and he now is regarded as a master of laparoscopy surgery. He has been uh, traveling to different areas in the world and he is regarded as a very competent and innovator in laparoscopy surgery by all laparoscopy groups. He founded the James Hospital in Chennai with a uh, department of gastroenterology. He founded MRC and he received BCRA award two times. This gentleman in Delhi was another important uh, person for spearing the laparoscopic work in India. He initially started work in Ganganam Hospital and lot of people from different parts of India used to flock to him for basic training in laparoscopy. And now he is based in Max Hospital Delhi. Dr. R.K. Mishra, if you open up YouTube and uh, internet, you'll find uh, his tremendous contribution. He has units in Dubai and, U and USA. He runs a World Laparoscopy Hospital where he has structured training of different durations, one week, one month, some fellowships, and he offers uh, mentorship for a lot of surgeons. Dr. K. Ravindranath was in Apollo Hospital, Hyderabad. Long back, around 1992-93, he established a setup in Apollo Jubilee Hills at Hyderabad. And that time, he has a vision to create a training center at Jubilee Hospital Apollo, Hyderabad. And he has a happy feast for that. But a lot of people are trained under him, and, and these are the people who have started the special laparoscopy and the concept of mentoring. There is another hospital in, in Coimbatore, you will find in internet that is described as Institute, Indian Institute of Laparoscopic Surgery. This is now run by Dr. V. Vankatesh. Little bit about the history of laparoscopy in Kolkata. Uh, if you are all knowing that the first laparoscopic procedure in Kolkata was done by a pediatric surgeon, Dr. Ashish Mukhopadhyay. He did this way back in 1991. And then in a small setup in, in Takurgachi, in a Shushusa nursing home. And then he continued his laparoscopic work for a long time in his own setup. The first lab cholecystectomy was done in a government hospital during ASICON 1992. And Dr. U.S. Aurora, who was the professor head of surgery at NRS Medical College, could procure a laparoscopic unit for NRS Medical College on the occasion of ASICON and he continued this laparoscopy work with Dr. Mithunjo Mukherjee. This gentleman unfortunately leave the medical education service, but he had the vision. He started first laparoscopy work in Calcutta Medical College, but subsequent to change of government policy, he left the job, but he continued his laparoscopy and until today he is doing very good laparoscopy surgery in different setup in Calcutta. This gentleman is another uh, known face in our community. He started his laparoscopy surgery work way back in 1992. He started his work in a small setup in Goriahat, Apollo Clinic, and he subsequently worked in Anandolok, Apollo, and now he has set up a own hospital as Genesis, and he is mentor to many of our a uh, lab surgeon working in different medical colleges and peripheral setup. Dr. B.K. Bhartia, 
He is another pioneer uh, lab surgeon in Kolkata who started the first FNB course at CMRI Kolkata. Although now this course is being faded up by uh, CMRI, but Dr. Bhartia has this persistence to start this course in CMRI and also he trained boys in MRI. Now he has built up his own setup at Parkby Hospital, Salt Lake. Dr. Om Tatia has created his own setup in Shirolaparishaj in Kolkata and this is a center which offers different short term training courses and lot of our uh, youngsters, our practice surgeons are trained under him in his institute. Way back in 1994-95, uh, another uh, place for leprosy work was in Kothari Medical Center under the guidance of Dr. S. Kagarwal and Dr. V. Lakshman. This gentleman from a peripheral unit, he is based in Malda, Dr. Manabesh Pramanik. But we are amazed to know that way back in 1995-96, he started a laparoscopic work and he is pioneer not only in basic laparoscopy. Way back in 2000-2010, he could perform all advanced laparoscopy procedure, including retroperitoneoscopy. And now he runs his own setup, Dishari Health Care at Malda. So the list is unending. This is just a small list of reputed surgeons who are young stars or senior surgeons who are doing exemplary job in laparoscopy work in Kolkata. And I remember that uh, the first lab setup in SSKM was in 1998 and Dr. Anandinath Acharya was a visionary who could think of and in spite of lot of resistance he could get the machine at SSKM hospital. So in West Bengal at the moment we have this setup in all medical colleges, we have this setup in all uh, corporate hospitals in Kolkata, apart from this even in peripheral rural setup this basic laparoscopy procedure is now available, we have trained people. So what about just five minutes for this next part of this, uh, how is the modern era of laparoscopy? There has been tremendous change which allow us to go in for more and more complex procedures. These are in the form of getting good newer energy devices. These are in the form of getting better viewing system. And if you talk of future perspective, we have the newer innovations like robotics, nodes and seals. So this energy devices has allow us to perform complex procedure which is difficult earlier in view of bleeding. So we have the conventional electrosurgical device, we have a ligature vesting sealing devices, you will be amazed to know that we have this uh, gadgets which are so costly available only from multinational company, now few Indian company has come up which are very cheap and having the same efficacy of a vessel sealing device. So this is Ligasure. Next came in 1993 the great revelation of ultrasound being used as an energy device, the harmonic. This is a newer innovation, is a combination of ultrasonic and vessel sealing device, is Thunderbeat and argon plasma coagulator. This innovation also has been very rapid in devices like newer gadgets of monitor and the viewing system. We started with a single chip camera, then came three chips, then came the 3D vision. We started with a simple TV monitor, subsequently we have HD monitor. Now the modern version is a 4K monitor where you have a very large vision. Light source started with halogen, then xenon and now is a LED light source. In sufflator, it started with 9 liters, that means in one minute you can have 9 liters of gas coming into the abdomen. But if you are doing a very complex procedure where you are bleeding, you need to uh, suck very rapidly, you need in with a very high flow. So now we have a 
40 liter insufflators available. There has been tremendous change in hand instruments and different companies like I should mention that a Carl Storch is a really a, a reputed company who takes research and takes into account the different gadgets required for the surgical interventions. This is a modern operation theater where you have multiple monitors for the anesthetist to see, for the assistant to see and the surgeon to have a look at this vision. And this is an advancing field of surgery now. And if you talk of the present status, at the moment you have the access to both basic and advanced laparoscopic procedures. There has been some procedure are declared as gold standard like lab cholecystectomy, lab adrenalectomy and the procedure which are earlier called as advanced now is under basic laparoscopy like hernia surgery. And there has been some conflict and doubt about oncological surgery but this oncological surgery again is coming up as part of advanced laparoscopy surgery and the reports of some inferiority of laparoscopic procedure in view of abdominal wall recurrence, long term survival, the subsequent publications have proved that laparoscopic oncological surgery for colon and rectum is comparable or in fact is some way better in view of the early recovery and return to work in con contrast to the open surgery. So if you talk of future perspectives of this minimal invasive surgery, we are hoping to have a newer modality like robotics. The nodes, although these nodes and seals has not gained popularity in view of the technological advancement, the learning curve, but they are the future of laparoscopic surgery. Robotics, nodes, seals. So a few points about the training facilities for laparoscopic surgery. There has been a formation of laparoscopic surgery training center throughout the world. And in India also you have a huge number of training centers. And at the moment uh, MCI criteria says that for any postgraduate training of MS, one has to have exposure to laparoscopic surgery. So at the moment, the basic laparoscopic training is in the curricula of postgraduate students. And apart from this, apart from this, there are different degrees and fellowship courses. FNB course is offered by National Board of Examination in Minimal Access Surgery. There is the MCH course in Tamil Nadu, which offers MCH in Minimal Access Surgery three years. The Maharashtra University of Health Sciences runs a fellowship in Minimal Access Surgery for two years course. Apart from this, there are short term courses, fellowships run by different institutions like JM Coimbatore, JN Mumbai, World Laparoscopy Hospital Delhi, ILS Coimbatore, ILS Kolkata. Apart from this, few associations like MRC, IAGS, AWR, they are very instrumental in having the progress of the laparoscopy and mentoring of new generation of students live operative workshops during the conferences and mid-term conferences. MRC offers FMS as a fellowship, IAGS offers FIAGS and also offer FLS in different sub-specialties. And after presentation of papers, some bursary awards allow these youngsters to have observatory in reputed centers. So there are tremendous training facilities for our youngsters. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Anyone have any questions to ask uh, Dr. Shah? No, nothing is talked. <laughs> Just <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Thank you okay. so much for enlightening us on this talk. So, uh, to set up your laparoscopy unit, you need to know how to do troubleshooting. Like what are the troubles you may face and how to shoot all this problem instantly. So this is a very important topic if you want to practice in laparoscopic surgery in future.
So we have a consultant, uh, advanced laparoscopic colon colorectal surgeon from Jain Hospital Chennai, our very own dear Dr. Pinak Das Gupta. I'd like to invite him on dais on, and uh, uh, tell him, tell us about the OT setup and troubleshoot in laparoscopic surgery. Good morning. Good morning, Sumanta. Good morning, the stakeholders of uh, Ruby Hospital who have pulled up a wonderful job and brought all of us here for this training session. So it's a first workshop conducted by Sumanto and team. And uh, so far I see a lot of attendance and it has been really informative since morning. Well, I, I'll be speaking on equipment setup and troubleshooting. I am Dr. Pinak Dasgupta from Gem Hospital, Chennai, where I work as a colorectal robotic hernia and AWO surgeon. So laparoscopic surgery, as Dr. Shaha has already uh, told that how it has evolved and that in, it involves uh, high-tech things. A lot of things has changed and it is still in evolution. It involves multiple components, delicate electrical circuits, and it's working in a unique environment unlike in open surgery. And more and more we are getting technology dependent. So we should be aware of all these things to keep up and do, do standard world-class job. So the few things which one has to keep in mind is that the size of the OT, unlike open surgery, which doesn't need too much of a space because of a lot of instruments involved. You have the light source, insufflators and whatnot. So you need a bigger OT setup. You have to take care that where the door of OT opens, whether if you need some extra instrument, how that is going to come inside. So all those things have to be kept in mind. Similarly, uh, the anesthetist also needs a lot of monitoring. The anesthesia equipments also have improved over time. Uh, it is advised that one should uh, come sufficiently early into the operating theater and assess by himself like what all things he'll be needing and what all uh, instruments are required and how the position of the patient should be positioned, how the theater table should be set up so that there is no clutter or there is no problem during the surgery. Uh, there should be an equipment checklist. The anesthetist, anesthetist should confirm that his uh, instruments are fine. The technicians should confirm that the operating table is functional. The camera unit, light source, the carbon dioxide insufflators, the electrosurgical units, all should be pre-checked before we start the actual surgery. This is how a laparoscopic cart looks like. This basically uh, stacks will be there so that you can place all the equipments and anything wrong will be reflected right in front of your eyes. So as Sir has already informed that the camera system has evolved and now more and more uh, even the smaller stuff setups are using high definition cameras and even uh, 4K setups are pretty common nowadays. Light source again, there are previously there used to be halogen but it's uh, no more used nowadays and mostly it is xenon or the LED cold light source. So light is very, very necessary. More so if there is some bleeding inside, if you don't have a good light source, it will be dark and you'll be forced to convert. So that, that becomes frustrating and your journey to advanced laparoscopy gets stunted. So you should always have a good light source. Light cables, well, there, are, there used to be fluid-filled cables, which we don't find nowadays. Most of them have been replaced by fiber optic cables which increases the amount of light transmitted and increases the quality of the video. Uh, telescope the rod lens system with a uh, camera system at the end of the telescope is what is used nowadays. It comes in zero degree or a 30, which is most commonly used. 45 degree and 70 degrees are also available to increase the field of view. They come from three millimeter diameter to up to 12 millimeter and 33 centimeter long to 45 centimeters bariatric scopes. Monitor again, it can be a high definition monitor, it can be medical grade uh, 2K monitor or nowadays 4K monitors. This is one important slide. So any, uh, the entire surgery depends on the imaging system. So if there is any disturbance in any of these units, your, the clarity of the vision won't be there. So it starts from the camera head, the telescope. If it is not clear, the vision won't be clean. If the light cables are faulty, the amount of light transmitted won't be good. 
if there is any problem in the camera processing unit, if the plug, it is not plugged in properly, the quality of the image will deteriorate. And similarly, if there is any defective cable which is transmitting the video from the processing unit to the monitor, the image quality will suffer. Insufflator, the high flow insufflator is recommended. So basically this will maintain the carboperitoneum which will allow us to operate. The basic instruments which we need are trocars, dissectors, grasper, hooks and needle holders. So most of you would be familiar with these things. And this is how a laparoscopy trolley looks like with all the instruments in place, the light cables, the uh, gas cable, the trocars and all. Trocar has three parts, the obturator, the cannula and the valve. It, come, it can be uh, the pyramidal tip type, it can be the blunt tip type or the pointed tip type. Most of the time pyramidal type is used because it splits the muscle and goes inside easily without causing much trauma. Then again it can be a multi-use one or the disposable one. This is uh, how the disposable trockers look like. Graspers can be pointed, flat, curved or fenestrated depending on the organ which you are handling will choose the type of grasper. It can be serrated or it can be toothed clawed graspers. Hook can be unprotected or ceramic coated hook. Again, ceramic coated hook are more frequently preferred nowadays. Needle holder is one of the important uh, tool for a surgeon who doing advanced laparoscopic surgery. Again, one has to choose according to uh, the type of surgery and personal preferences, a curved jaw or a flat jaw, a platypus jaw. Working angle also, it comes in 90 degree or straight. Again, this is a preference of the surgeon. Your laparoscopy uh, tray, the mount tray should contain, should have uh, two scalpels and 11 and 15 mm blades, the towel clips, the varus needle or the Hassan cannula depending on the type of technique which is used to establish pneumoperitoneum, insufflation tubes, uh, micropore filter to filter out the carbon dioxide gas before it goes inside the abdomen, the fiber optic cable, cameras and all. Retractors in hernia surgery, army navy retractors or ass retractors are used and various type of cannulas, whether 5 mm or 10 mm, depending on the procedure you choose. And there should be some extra cannulas available because during the procedure, the cannula can get con contaminated accidentally and you may have to replace. So uh, one, uh, one or two extra cannula is always handy. Again, uh, graspers, the list of instruments which uh, the basic uh, tray should contain. So, uh, scissors, bipolars. Then at the end of surgery, you will need a port closure device to close all your incisions which are 10 millimeter and above. Uh, depending on the, uh, whether you are doing an advanced surgery or at times even a cholecystectomy may need an uh, ultrasonic dissector or other energy devices. So this is the ba basic setup. So uh, the surgeon usually stands opposite to the side of uh, pathology with the camera assistant. So you can see here uh, the surgeon, uh, the, uh, the assistant nurse will be standing on the side of the pathology. Usually the surgeon will stand opposite to the pathology. The, all the uh, instruments, all the instruments should be in the field of vision of the surgeons. Uh, here is a hernia surgery in progress. You can appreciate that the surgeon, uh, the a surgeon is standing opposite to the monitor and he has the entire view of uh, how the insufflator is, uh, what are the pressures, how much brightness is there, the camera settings, uh, the light settings, everything is under uh, directly uh, in his field of vision so that any problem comes he can troubleshoot at earliest. So an useful principle to remember is that laparoscope must point towards the quadrant of the abdomen with the pathology and the surgeon stands opposite to the pathology. So this is how the setup should be. Uh, one should be aware of all the plugs. It's a little bit cumbersome but if you get used to it, uh, it's simple. Uh, there will be, uh, the camera processing unit will have some out. So from which the signals, the video signals will be sent out and then it goes either to the recording system or to the monitor. 
So in the monitor, it will be video in. So from the camera processing unit, video out goes to the monitor, video in. So that uh, now you can, whatever processed image comes out from the processing unit is reflected in the monitor. Similarly, uh, in sub letter, uh, there, there, there is usually a cutoff alarm. Suppose if the pressure goes above 20, automatically the, uh, the alarm system will uh, uh, warn the user and automatically the flow of carbon dioxide will stop. So these are sort of like uh, standard with most of the systems nowadays. But still, it, uh, before uh, you, we start the procedure, someone has to check that everything is in place and everything is functioning. So once you are gowned and globed, uh, you, sh you should check that the light cable is connected, the, uh, the camera, the uh, the camera processing unit is appropriately plugged in, your saline irrigation system is functional. You should uh, check the various needle before you put inside for establishment whether the spring action is functioning or not. You should check the valves, whether they are open or not, whether there is any leak in the washers. All those things have to be checked before you actually start the procedure. Now once you have started the procedures, then there can be problems as well. So you, one should be aware that uh, if certain problems comes, where, where exactly the problem lies. So if there is poor insufflation, you are unable to achieve the adequate pressure or abdomen is not getting distended, then what could be the reason? So one should start, one, if, he, if he knows that what, where all the problems can go, he can just run through and it, it, whether the carbon dioxide tank is full or not if any side channels are open in the trocars, if there is uh, stop cocks are leaking, if there is a loose stage suture, the gas may leak from the periphery of the trocars. If there is any tube leak, that also can be picked up with a high flow rate, but a low pressure inside. So these, uh, these things should be remembered so that as and when some problem comes, we can jump and troubleshoot those problems. Similarly, if there is sudden rise in the intraabdominal pressure, we should see that the, whether the various needle is inside the peritoneal cavity or not, whether the tubes are occluded or the stop cut could be accidentally turned off. Or at times if the patient is light, that time also the pressures will be high. Similarly, uh, problems may come in the camera, uh, uh, camera system, so whether the camera, uh, the camera is plugged inside the camera processing unit or not, one has to check whether any cable is faulty which is connecting the uh, vision out to the vision in into the monitor. So if a break in the cable is there, that also can pro cause problem. In inadequate lighting, many times the light cables are like, because of re repeated usage, the light cables, uh, the fiber inside the light cable may fracture. So though you may have a a good light source, but if it is not transmitted adequately, if only say 20 or 30 percent of light gets transmitted, obviously in spite of having a good light source, you won't have a proper vision. Or the bulb, uh, they have some 300 hours or three, sorry, 3,000 hours of usage. So if that usage hour is passed, then the amount of uh, uh, light produced decreases and that decreases the quality of vision. So this is how a poor light will look. So this is an, uh, just because a change in the light cable, you can see the stark change in the difference in the vision. Again, wh while doing surgery, we have the habit of smudging the lens against the liver or something to clear, but that is not advisable. It is always preferred to use hot water so that because the carbon dioxide is cold, so that produces some amount of fogging, so it is advisable that you dip the lens in hot water for 10 seconds and then go inside to prevent fogging. Light cables need to be changed frequently and if you are doing an interesting case or something which you want to record and show in a conference, it is preferable that you, use, you keep a separate light cable for that which will give you the best quality of recording and vision. Again, blurred vision could be because of cracked lens or sometimes it is because because uh, the OT will be chill, uh, will maintain a 
temperature of around 18 to 20 degrees. So sometimes uh, it produces moisture in between the camera processing head and the telescope. So one has to look that if there is moisture and this thing, that also decreases the vision. It can also be, be uh, due to inaccurate focusing. Uh, again, uh, cautery system, if it is not functional, one should go and ensure that it is properly grounded. Though now present generation cautery systems will have indicator, if it is not grounded, a LED light will blink. If it is grounded, it will be green. If there is any loose connection, that has to be seen. If the pedal, pedal has to be connected to the backside of the generator. So that if it is connected, then only it will work. There can be insulation failures, which may not uh, lead to it, uh, uh, the cauterization of the structures. There, may be, there can be fracture in the cable, or there can be defective grounding plate. So before inserting the instrument, one should also uh, see, uh, ensure that the laparoscopic instrument is properly insulated and there is no damage to the outer sheath because insulation failures like this can cause serious damage. <coughs> so with this, I would like to end my talk. And most of the things I think will be more uh, discussed in detail during the live sessions or while we operate because this is something which is uh, supposed, supposedly to be discussed live rather than in talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pinagda. Thank you. So if you have anyone, anyone having any questions regarding the OT setup and troubleshoot, you can ask Dr. Dasgupta. Okay, we'll discuss in detail yeah. during our operation. Operation. Thank you. Okay.